Well, Kyle, that's a better start than Stormblood. <laughs> oh, oh, leading right in, huh? <laughs> We're coming down off of it, dude. We're coming down off of Stormblood. And, you know, it ends strong. Stormblood ends really strong. And honestly, once we got the Doma Castle, I loved Stormblood. I was on board at that point, and I think it was pretty great throughout all of that. I don't know what I was expecting from the start of Shadowbringers. I figured we'd be off to go save our friends from whatever fate they have as their bodies just lay in a room they refuse to show us. But you know what? What was definitely not on my bingo card, I did not think that we would be fighting murderous angels while we euthanize the children. <laughs> we didn't yet though. There's still a chance. But we'll get we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Yes. Yeah. So if you're uh if you're somehow watching this and you've never played Final Fantasy 14, don't worry, we will explain ourselves. By the way, please leave a comment below if you are one of the rare people that are watching us but you haven't played Final Fantasy 14. Uh, I guess you don't care about spoilers, but I want to hear from you because I want to know if those people exist. So, we got to go back to the beginning. Shadowbringer starts off seemingly small. And I'm not just saying that because we start by talking to Tataru. It starts, I mean, we literally, we just, we just head on over to the Rising Stones and we click on Tataru and that's how you start Shadowbringers. But right off the bat, we go to a new custom little zone. They could have, like, Square could have easily just reused the Crystal Tower. It's right there. You can go to it. They could have had us just pray return to the crystal tower and click on a thing. Nope. They go and render out a beautiful little trench set piece that we have to go walk into. It's also creepy and misty and wonderful. Well, think about it for a moment, though. You're all impressed that they made this custom area. Really, opening night, you would want everybody jumping and spinning and dancing and in their lingerie around where you're about to go find the object to go to the first? No. We had to take it into a nice, calm, solo moment. The warrior of light down there finding the beacon, the boon. Dude, I loved this set piece. I thought the uh, the circus trench just it just looked cool. And it's it is kind of the calm before the storm, essentially, like right here at the beginning of, of this expansion. You just going down there. It just seems mysterious. You could hear a pin drop. And then we are off to the races once we find that beacon. But first, hey everybody, camera's going wide today because we have a merch store now. To celebrate finishing Stormblood, Kyle and I commissioned, uh, one sec. It's big. Okay, don't fall. We got a glare there. Hey, so anyway, to celebrate finishing Stormblood, Kyle and I commissioned this piece of Valentuna. It's really freaking good. It's actually the best lighting I've seen it in so far. Yeah, so it's called uh, Tune In Val Out of the Storm. It's what we're calling this piece. And if you aren't aware of like what's going on in the Grinding Gear community, there's a wonderful artist by the name of Rosalind, and they sent in the first piece of fan art that we ever got, and it was freaking awesome. So we asked them if we could commission a full print for when we get to Shadowbringers. Well, we're done with Stormblood now. We're in the Shadowbringers. So enjoy this awesome piece of art, complete with all three members of the Barking Triad out in full force. It's so adorable, I kind of just want to die looking at this thing. Anyways, you can access our store page by going to buyourbromance.com. That's buyourbromance.com to get a hold of our Out of the Storm print. Thanks. Hey, Kyle, everything feels like a clue. Why is the beacon an iWork symbol? I was thinking about this, and originally I had no idea, except Exarch would want you to pick it up, right? And now we know that when... I guess he duplicated or teleported or copied the crystal tower into the first. It brought with it all the random bits and bobs and coinage that adventurers had left in there, including ironwork stuff. So he would have this. And if it went to the first and then he sent it back, it would be connected. It have astral threads on it. Sure. I have a remarkable amount of I just accept everything at this point going on. Like, oh, yeah, the, there's so much of this. The world probably glaze over because it's 
it's detailed, but to the grander narrative, it's, I would say, not the most important. But they go to great detail of like, this is why Gil is the same. And I'm just sitting there being like, dude, I'm on another, I'm in another universe. I, I'm fine. I accept yeah. this. Ghost yeah. in my hotel room? Sure. Why not? All makes sense to me. Everything I have, the warrior of light have seen, I have no questions. I have no questions. Point me at the baddie. Yeah, this whole, the whole opening of Shadowbring is, is, is fantastic. And I can't, I love Stormblood, but I can't help but think about it. Like, what a stark contrast of just how breakneck the beginning of Shadowbringers feels compared to the beginning of Stormblood, where it's like, welcome to Alamigo. Go talk to 28 people and an old man seven times. By the time you've stopped questioning why Biggs and Wedge sound that way, you were literally falling through space to another freaking dimension. Pretty cool, right? It is very cool. It gave me a real Twin Peaks vibe, falling through space while crystals with the photoshopped faces of people we know and love fly by. So at first I'm like, oh, are they all dead people that were going past? Is this like the, 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 the land between... You know, before like death is final, like while the while your ether is traveling, no, because then immediately like Arianje, Ishtola, Emmerich, Yatsuyu, Gaius fly by. It's like some are alive, some are dead. Doesn't matter. It's just like a lot of Leo pointing. I know all of those people. Yeah, it's not the people we're leaving behind necessarily. It's not the dead, nor is it the people who went with us. So I think it's more of just a refresher, kind of to get your mind in that emotional space of what you're trying to save, all the characters you've met. It's a character-driven story, after all. Such a nice, like, stepping over the threshold moment for this expansion. And, of course, there's also, like, blink and you miss it. There's two seemingly very important characters that go by or that we crash into. So we go by the Warrior of Darkness. We did everything right. Everything that was asked of us. And still, still it came to this. And we even as the Warrior of Light, reach out and, and try and grab it and, and miss it, you know, and kind of turn our back as we're falling. And what I'm sitting there going, wait, was that important, this Warrior of Dark? Too late. Minfilia, referred to as the Oracle of Light, who is holding back a wave of light, which we're going to learn more about later. Head turns around, looks at us, and tells us, Your time has not yet come. I'm getting like this weird like land of the dead vibe but they keep dissuading that with other scenes and factoids so I'm not sure well we find out later that Orianje had a vision of the future while he was flying through this true so maybe it's it's a it's a bending of time and space we saw things from the past maybe we saw things from the future I bet you could probably go back and like go frame by frame on that. Look at the people in the crystals in and try and place when that was taken. So obviously the warrior of darkness, that's from the past. We saw that scene with Ardbert. Yeah. Ardbert. That is a name, but we've seen that scene and we know that it happened in the past, but you know, maybe, maybe some of those things on the fringes, maybe those are in the future. And now we know that the scene with the Oracle of light is also in the past, but it's the firsts past. Not ours. Not the sources. I'm blowing your mind right now, aren't I? You did a really good breakdown. This is nice. This is nice. It's, it's not that far into the beginning of Shadowbringers that we get a, a history lesson. There's also the element that this isn't the vision, I assume, that others would see traveling to the first because they left their bodies behind. And we don't. We take our whole body there. That's, that's true. I would imagine there's some similarities, though, right? Because... Likely. It, we get the vibe that the Crystal Exarch was doing the same ritual to bring us over. It's just that it was imperfect until they brought us. When in reality, it's probably, you know, just the game designers going, we need them to be able to go from the first back to the other world that they already spent time in because it's an MMO and we just need that. So we're going to come up with a reason. It's a good reason. They did a good job writing it. I like it. But it is a tiny bit convenient. Oh, sure. No, I, it, yeah. It'd be wonderfully thematic if every time you walked into Ulda or Limza, there's all these sleeping bodies all around the crystal, and you're like, huh, I'm playing Shadowbringers, are you? <laughs> have, have fun. <laughs> but, but no, you know, the whole body goes. You can teleport back and forth. Yeah. There's a fairy that shows up and justifies everything about your bank. They cover their bases, but also there's a nice little... Don't think about it too much right now. 
where, where they need it, where they need it, which is mostly with time, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. So we see Minfilia, Oracle of Light, and then we arrive on the first and we get our first run in with the Warrior of Darkness ghost. Doesn't really say anything, just stands over us, kind of creepy looking. It is very clearly the Warrior of Darkness. And we have another run in with his ghost later on where he takes a more recognizable form and we actually get to have a conversation with him. But now I'm going to start marking this, Kyle. I'm going to start marking every time we have a run in with Ardbert's ghost. And this is number one. I thought he like straight up died. Like he was sent back to the first where his body was dead and that would be the end of him. And the other ones aren't haunting us either. It's becoming muddled as we go through. And I have, I have more to talk about that much later in our conversation. So we wake up, see a spooky ghost run into a traveling merchant that I believe if you did Ulda first, you would recognize. Again, like are, are, are people copied here or is it just a, Story convenience to kind of get you in the mood and have a sort of reset feel to everything. Somewhat, yes. If you didn't do Evil East, you wouldn't have seen Bun Girls before you got here. That's true. So if you skipped Evil East, you might think, oh, Bun Girls are from the first. That's but that's not the case. You you run into them first in in Evil East. Uh we haven't seen the Lala Fells yet. On the first, I don't know if really? you. I don't know if you noticed, or should I say, you noticed the lack of. We haven't seen a Lalafell yet. Yeah, you're right. I mean, obviously, other players, but well, no NPCs. Interesting. We've seen plenty of Lalafells following us around, but they couldn't outrun the wave. <laughs> <laughs> so much happens that I, I think it would be easy to like speed past the traveling merchant real quick. But the traveling merchant is our first hint to. How much time has passed since the calamity on the first? Because he makes a bad dad joke about the night sky or lack thereof. And then says, oh, my father used to tell that one all the time. And essentially insinuates that it's been about a hundred years. So time is working weird. And if only I knew somebody who streams and makes videos about Final Fantasy XIV, who looked at the Crystal Exarch and said, I bet time works differently on the first. You know, if only somebody I knew was that right, that correct about things. It would be convenient. It would be fun, too, to have time go faster on another dimension. And that seems to be what's happening. And we get more explanation of that later. But for now, it's just a cool feature of the MMO where days don't last days. You know, you'll play the game for three hours, you'll see day, night, day, night, day, night. You get to see lots and lots of different environments. You get to hear the different music. Here on the first, it's a big contrast to how things look on the source. And I think it's a wonderful touch. Whether just for story bits, it's very thematic and it immediately immerses you in that other world. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good stuff. And then we, we kind of, much like the cinema, we talked about the cinematic, how there's the moment with the VR and it's like, here's your big advertisement for the expansion, new race, new class, bonus points, they're hot. We run into a Viera dancer as a guard who bars our path as we're trying to, you know, head towards what we're about to learn. It's called the Crystarium. Uh, okay. She was probably inspecting. She wanted to know where we were from in case we had light corruption in us oh damn That's probably why she was guarding the door otherwise Hadn't she's gonna send us off to camp that. camp sadness doesn't matter where we're from though if there's a senior right at the door <laughs> like well, if you're just later if you're just straight up from the outside wouldn't wouldn't that be cause for concern would where you hail from would that even matter i think so actually yes because if they're birthing or at least kind of coming and adjacent to the light wave that's why the camp of sadness is on the edge of <sighs> everything Okay. So it's more dangerous and you're more likely to get corrupted over there. Whereas the crystal is right in the middle of everything at the safest point. Like I said, I accept it. I have no questions. So we learned about Sin Eater's uh, poor, poor traveling merchant did not make it. Yeah. Lost our, we lost our, our, we just made that friend already dead, already eaten by a Sin Eater. It, it sort of builds a dialogue that the name Sin Eater kills people who are currently sinning. I don't know if that's true, but he was getting sauced in the forest. Probably not a safe thing to do. Yeah. Innocents definitely get 
killed by sin eaters later on um yeah i just don't know if you can provoke it like can you walk into the woods and you know be drinking and you know like hanging out sinning and stuff and when they all get pissed off what's the moral code that these sin eaters are operating under so you're saying on the first it's just one big friday the 13th movie and anyone who is not morally in yes. the right uh die while having sex in their sleeping bag exactly teenage rules horror movie slasher okay so um, I'm still in my mind. I know they're sin eaters, but I've been calling these light scent because, boy, howdy, do they seem like the opposite of void scent. Pretty, pretty safe connection to make. Our, our buddy shows up now named as the Crystal Exarch. I'm going to keep calling him not Graha. Graha Amnesia is what I'm going to refer to him as. Yeah, we get a moment where you can basically corner him about this and he says no. So it's been 100 years for the guy. Maybe he's role played too long. He puts it in a very specific word that, like, I don't know. He basically says, I don't know that name. Like, it like it doesn't even register. Like, no memory. So, I, I think we're dealing with good old-fashioned anime amnesia here. So Oh, your favorite. Yes, I actually hate it. It is one of my least favorite tropes in any fiction, let alone anime. But it was done really well with Yatsuyu. So, I am willing. Final Fantasy fourteen has earned its amnesia, as far as I'm concerned. Well, and we don't know if he's physically here yet. And that could also be the source of his amnesia. Like he might be sleeping. Graha might be oh, in the tower you think sleeping. If we, if we go to the, if we broke into the crystal tower back on the source, that Graha's body will just be laying there. Oh, he'd be still like up in the wall, like frozen in crystal, all freaky. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, totally. but we meet our friends, and their bodies were left behind, and they know exactly who they are. Well, we we meet Alice. Say maybe yes. Maybe someone else will be. Conv- oh. Is that, been here as long though. Is that why Yashtola thinks she's <gasps> uh, thinks she's uh, Matoya? Yeah, yeah. And Orianje thinks he's an astrologian, right? Like they, <laughs> maybe they got a little confused in transfer. Uh, 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 sure, <laughs> why not? Uh, uh, and this concludes this edition of probably wrong theories. Until uh, we have another no, one. No, no, we're not done yet. We're, no. We got a lot, we got a lot no, to go still, today. Still going on. Still going on. But yeah, th- this was this was all a good introduction to the first it, 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 in a way that like it, it establishes the stakes, but also like it drove home for me very quickly. Like this is where we're going to be hanging out. Like it also talked to me within the framework of an MMO because like getting stopped by a guard is something that's very normal in an online RPG. Okay. So it's a big deal. We're here, but also this might be the new normal. We're just going to treat this like any other world or any other zone that we played through in Final Fantasy XIV so far, because I didn't know. I, I haven't looked up anything about Shadowbringers. I didn't know that we were going to the first, and it appears to be the primary continent, essentially, for lack of a better word, that we're going to be adventuring on for this entire expansion. Well, and this is where you want to absorb it. You want to front end your world building. It's what you're used to in an MMO, and I think that's the stumbling point of Stormblood, is that you do it, and Raugr's Reach isn't that exciting and that deep to dig into. There's not really that much to see when you get there. And when you get to Kugane, there is a lot to dig into. But you feel like you're doing it again because you did Rauger's Reach. And you quickly exit the, the, the kind of operatic setting of Kugane, and you're then dealing with small warring factions again, much, which makes it seem actually rather similar to what we were doing out, out at Rauger's Reach. Anywho, I, I really like this intro. It is a really strong intro to an MMO expansion. I, I'm trying to think of if I played this at the time, if this was brand new and you're you're stuck in the, you're being wrapped up in the zeitgeist of everybody going through it for the first time. This feels like a dark portal moment. Like we, we spent a lot of time talking about how we are burned out on World of Warcraft and, and finding new joy in Final Fantasy XIV, but... This I, I mean this as a the highest compliment because in terms of major landmark occurrences that I've played through in online RPGs, going through the Dark Portal is really up there for me. And that's what this feels like. It seems to have that level of holy shit, it's real now. Shit has hit the fan. And it's a good city. It's just a pretty city. It's got all the parts you want to role play in. You gotta go a little, you got a little bar and restaurant, you got the inn that's real fancy. You got the giant library, all the places for your crafting knees, a big center square where people can hang out while they're waiting for the raids. Granted, you know, we're now seeing this way after the fact, and people are probably off in some other Endwalker city now, but it's still just a cool place to be. 
Crystarium's a, a, a top tier MMO city. Before we get to the welcome to Shadowbreakers moment, which I bet is why you probably clicked on this video, it's time for a history lesson. We learned a lot about the first. An extremely detailed children's book, but I guess when your whole world is dangerous, maybe you need to warn the children a little heavy like. I mean, what is it like five pages? Is it really that detailed? That's true. What well, you maybe the librarian's embellishing. The detail is coming from more in the librarian. And he, I like to think that we're also sitting on the floor with our legs crossed and Morin is on a chair with the book opened up, turned outward. And you see this? This is where Menphilia saved all our asses. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If there was ever a Obama awarding Obama moment, this is it. <laughs> Congrats, Menphilia. You saved everybody from yourself. <laughs> a real hero there. Well, isn't that interesting, though? We get the gaps filled in, what the merchant was kind of alluding to with how much time has passed. Here it is written in parchment. Century ago, villains known as the Warriors of Light slew the Shadow Keeper, the Steward of Darkness. If we were playing Zelda, these words would be in a different color in <laughs> yes, the text I box. <laughs> I thought that too. Maybe even shaking <laughs> to really emphasize that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, note, Warriors of Light existed in this world. Note, there was an um, important figure called the Shadow Keeper, the Steward of Darkness, who apparently is a heroic figure on the first. So we fought the Warriors of Darkness. Who were the Warriors of Light? And are they still out there? And fightable. So apparently that is what triggered the, that was the, the catalyst for the beginning of the end. For the first, this is what triggered what they refer to as the flood of light, which I think is relatively uh, apt name considering we see like frozen, like tsunami waves of light. Oh, so cool! Yeah, and, yeah, it's very oh, the theming, dude. Oh, <laughs> let me get through this and then I'll lather compliments. Okay, okay, we'll talk about it later. Yeah, but it, it, we get so many details that everything the light touched was leached of life that a wasteland was left behind in everything that was consumed in the flood and that it seemed like all was lost until the Oracle of Light appeared or as, as we know, Menphilia showed up, stopped the flood and saved what is no, now known as, the, well, I could probably always known as the region of Norvrant, which is uh, sounds like the only still habitable portion of the first star of this planet that we're on. And then out of that, like they, they're like, okay, cool. Whew, we're safe. No, standing there showed up from the wastelands that were left in the wake of the flood and just started encroaching. And also an interesting point. I don't know how important this is, but Morin makes it sound like the night sky didn't disappear from Norvrant until the sin eater showed up. There's like specific mention of the sin eater showing up and the night sky being taken away. There's definitely a timeline, right? And the way I put it together is that stuff was still going down and super chaotic and squeezing when the Crystal Tower arrived with the Exarch. Which would line up perfectly because the Crystal Tower was done before Menphilia gave herself unto Hydaelyn. Which means Menphilia, there's still a little bit of stuff in there. You know, when we talked to her with the words, starting, there's a little bit of herself in there still. The new employee looked around and said, hey, what's this over here, Heidelin? And Heidelin's like, ah, don't, don't, don't look at the first. And Mephilia's like, we got to do something about this. And she personally, or some sort of influence, stopped the wall from closing in. Which, again, lines up with our timeline. Because A Realm Reborn ended after Grahatia went in the tower. And that lines up with the five years and the three years for the other Scions. So, it makes sense. If, if Mephilia was there as the Oracle of Light, it would have to have, and, and because of things we learned later, it would have to have been after she brought the Warriors of Darkness back with her. So now we know that, at least as far as the, the first is concerned, that was 100 years ago when that happened, even though for us, it seems like it hasn't been that long. I respect the shit out of Final Fantasy XIV for actually giving answers to questions, and sometimes those answers come a lot sooner than you would think. We get a meeting with the Crystal Exarch, and he's just like, hey, here's exactly what was going on with those creepy calls. Like, I have no more questions about the creepy throw wide the gates calls at the end of this. Like, it's all explained. Cool. I do, however, now have a slew of new questions to worry about. <laughs> 
It feels satisfying. It's good. It supplies the questions you had during that wait to the next expansion and poses interesting conundrums to enjoy in this expansion. Here's where we get into the time slippage, which I don't think is all that important because for the, it ends with the Crystal Exarch being like, hey, for some reason, now our time movement seems to be more or less in sync. You and I, at the time of recording this, we've only gone and met with Alice. We haven't done Alphano yet, which means we also haven't seen Thancred or Yanje or Yishtola. But I think that's the whole reason it's there because when we find Alice, it seems like time has passed. And I think that's going to, you're really going to start to notice that with Arianche and Yishtola, who have been here for three years, and with Thancred, who apparently has been here for five years. Thancred's been, apparently, I, the way the Crystal Legs are, like, hangs, like, Thancred's off with a new companion. Hmm. <laughs> Just like, I bet he is the old dog. I think the only reason they're getting into it is to explain the 100-year post-calamity timeline and also explain why our friends, the fellow Scions, been on a bit of a journey already by the time we catch back up with them. They get to have had a journey. They get to, you know, evolve as characters. While for us, out of the frying pan and into the fire that is Shadowbringers coming out of Stormblood. Yeah, and it's fun. Like, it's just fun to take those little ideas like I was just doing with Minfilia and the Crystal Tower and kind of plug them in. And then basically say, don't think about it too much. When you travel back and forth between the source, time is normal now. Don't worry about it. It's all good. It's fine. Your bank works. There's the tombstones on sale. It's fine. Yeah, it explains everything that apparently Graha Amnesia didn't mean to bring over the Scions, that it was a mistake while trying to bring us over. Also explains that their transference was incomplete, which is why their bodies are still back on the source. And then he, at some point goes even further to explain that they're essentially trapped, that they were like the Scions were all kind of working with Graha Tia to try with the Crystal Exarch to try and figure out a way to get back to their bodies. But literal years went by, and that's why they gave up and decided to, to, to spread out. Well, there's a bigger reason they decided to spread out and adventure across the first, and that's because of Orianje's vision. Apparently, while Orianje was on his Throw Wide the Gates call express trip to the first, Orianje saw a vision of the future where the rejoining is successful, and in it, we, the Warriors of Light, die. Orianje saw our death. And upon learning this, and also being unsuccessful in getting back to the source, that's when the science decide, it's been years, let's go out, let's try and you know scour the first, looking for any way to try and change the outcome of the rejoining being a, a success. Likely becoming embroiled in the first politics and machinations, meaning that when we find them, they'll also care about the people they find, like we do with Alize. I have no idea what they're hoping to find, by the way. Like, in terms of, like, oh, I know this where this is going. I don't. If you saw a vision of the rejoining happen, the first thing you'd want to do is go punch Varys in the face, but you can't. So you just do anything else you can on the first. And we'll see what that is. I'm going to go find a guy that looks like Varys on the first and punch him in the face. Honestly, it could go there. Getting the rejoining going could require some sort of Allegan Garlean machine, and then the Garleans invade the first. I, I don't know where this is going because I'm along for the ride. I'm already sold. I already bought the tickets. Let's go. And and I was feeling the same way. After getting all of these answers from the Crystal Legs arc, I'm like, yeah, let's go. But first, we need to check into our hotel, which is haunted. <laughs> Apparently staying at the Haunted Mansion. We run into the warrior of darkness, his ghost. It's it's interesting. He explains kind of the journey he's been on, that he's been a ghost since the rest of the warriors sacrificed themselves along with Minfilia to stop the flood of light. That seems important. It seems important that the other warriors were there. Because you're right, I was in the same mindset as you, that... Warriors of Darkness were going to their deaths, which I guess they still were, just not in the way I thought. I thought they she was just taking them back to the first and where they were just going to die immediately. Like they're they're going to move on from this from this mortal plane. And and Ardbert doesn't know how long it's been. Uh, he talks about how he, like over the course of being this ghost, which happened after you know the rest of the warriors in Minfilia sacrificed themselves, that he's like really lost 
control of his senses. It didn't really have a sense of where he was, how long it's been, anything like that, and that he didn't really snap back into consciousness until we arrive on the first. So that seems also telling. And his driving force appears to be that he wants to know why his soul lingers. It's a great story device. Midgard Sormer served this purpose as well through Heaven's Word. We now have a spirit companion, a Navi, if you will, that can tell us lore when we're questing by ourselves. And in that way, he provides the voiceover for our entrance into Amarang. Get back here! Is that... It can't be. So it's time for the Crystal Exarch to map explain us. Busts out the map, shows us Norvrant, all of the areas, which seem to roughly match up with our original starting zones. To the south, sure, it looks like it could have been Ulda, uh, where Yishtola is hanging out. Sure looks like it could be the Black Shroud, which I don't like the chances of that zone, considering Yishtola is standing in what looks like a burning Black Shroud in the Shadowbringer cinematic. And then Alphino is apparently hanging out in an island that sure looks like it could have been Limsa in a different reality. Which, by the way, we were talking about Garlemald. If there is a Garlemald equivalent on the first, I'm pretty sure it is gone. <laughs> oh, yeah, it would have been wiped out. Poor Kugane, completely gone. Just, pff, out of here. See yeah. ya. See, it's done for. Exarch gives us the choice of going with Alphano or Alize. You can go watch our stream and see that Kyle and I counted back from three and yelled who we wanted to go with first, and we both said Alize. One, two, two three, three, Alize. Alize. Okay. Yep, Alize. Perfect. Done. Done. So that's who... We went with also we ran a poll and it was Alize like off the off the charts, even though we told our stream <laughs> much to their chagrin that we're not going to listen to their choice. Now, granted, that poll said, what did you pick? And I think a lot mm. of people probably pick Alize first. You want to get invested. Plus, you just found Alize. She seemed pretty upset to be leaving. She didn't want to go. Alize, I feel, deserved to be saved first. Also, Alphina probably loves this. Alphina's probably off like in some castle, having wine, hanging out, for, <laughs> hanging out with people, like talking a bunch of stuff and figuring out things. When we find him, he'll probably be like, one minute, please. I'm still talking. Yeah, I wanted to go to Alizé first because we were just we, we were just adventuring with Alizé. We, we were we were it. We were brothers in arms like. To me, that seems the, the way to go. And I'm glad I went that way for the sake of this video, because holy shit, it goes places. We journeyed off to Amarang uh, in the Norvron tree. Isn't the whole thing Norvron? We meet some fun kobolds. I mean, mords in mord mm -hmm. soup. <laughs> in more soup, yes. And then we meet Tesslane, who's a chirurgeon. I mean, carer, who takes right. us to an inn, which is really an infirmary, which is really a hospice. Yeah. That Alize has been helping at. This, this is a happy, silly anime game, right? Uh huh. Yeah, real happy place here. It's some great world building, like the breaking of the purse thing. Like, there's some great open, world open building. Open your coin purse. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the the buying of the. We went with frogs together. I don't know why. I, I like frog legs. They're fine. I like, so frog, I like legs. frog legs. They're delicious. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. just a, a cute bit of very fast world building. I mean. Oh no, Final Fantasy can make you care about things really quick, right? Like that. That's basically the through line here. I have no doubt you get more answers, like more lore, if you go Alphano. But that's what I loved about Alize, is it taught me the world why I care. Now I care. I'm ready for Alphano. I'm ready for all those explanations. It sets up the extreme stakes, though. We still get a yes. big chunk of lore. We, we go out. We, we meet this lovely character, Tesslian, who explains everything that's going on at the end, and that it's not really an inn. And says that Alize is out on patrol. Why don't you go look for her? So we track her down out in the desert and we find her leaping off an impossibly high tower like a complete badass and dispatching mm -hmm. a sin eater like she's going grocery shopping. Like it's just yeah. a, just another day out. It's such a beautiful melancholy moment, this whole part, because Alize has so much confidence. You get to see her after a year has passed. She's really come into her own as this guard type. She's found a ton of confidence. <laughs> Man, did they destroy that vast and reset her right back. Well, do they? I, I think she still has it. Alizé explains all of her, all of her doubts and her, her hardships, but 
she seems very driven like because she ends like we have that moment where we're, we're standing up on a on like a high you know ruined tower right and she's explaining like we're looking out at the frozen wave of light and the wastelands beyond and you know we've 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 gone back to Mordsuk and and gotten the nectarines which yeah. become a really sad and and dark symbol i love nectarines i don't think i've ever had them i'm a clementine fan but we're standing on top of that tower having this 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 heart to heart with alizé cuz up up to this point I, I i like the initial meeting it's it's cute i like that alizé is a little little grumpy about how long it took us to get there but she doesn't hang on it too long they don't play a a trope which i don't like which is like someone you should get along with like farming them being angry for the sake of drama. I'm glad yeah. that they do not go down that road. I, I, I much like amnesia. I get annoyed with that trope in a lot of fiction. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So they don't do it here. So yeah, everything with Alizé is, Alizé is great. But, the, but to me, the meat of reconnecting with Alizé is this moment you know, looking out at the wasteland because she, she talks about how hopeless everything feels and she talks about it and it comes pouring out as part of her explaining like this, these are where people come to die. Also in the same stroke of the brush, we're learning that the sin eaters essentially have zombie rules that if you get injured by a sin eater and survive, you will then go on to become a sin eater yourself. I think that's the line where it says particularly powerful ones, but so far we've only seen one person just get straight up eaten whole everything but their ring by a sin eater. And then we saw we're about to talk about someone actually turning into a sin eater after, after uh, being, being stabbed. But you're right. It sets up the stakes. We get to see the vast emptiness beyond the wave of light. Oh, oh man. Do we get to go resident evil on this? You know, like you're going to need to be more specific. Bad guys like, like extracting sin stuff. And then they could be like, Ah, oh, I can't battle this warrior of light anymore. You know, in the like, ah, oh, I'm a sin eater. I'm a superpower myself. Good boss. That'd be a good boss. Boy, that does, sure does sound like how uh, how the Garleans would go about things, right? Right. They they go take the angel sword. Well, we won't go. We won't go. There. Oh, I could. Oh, yeah. What if? Yeah. yeah. What if you take an armament from a sin eater? Is it a sin eater's armament, or does it like like does it have? To, I, have I have lots of questions. I'm trying not to go. I want to finish with that on LSA. <laughs> I love that shit. Alizé explains how hopeless everything is and how that has affected her and how difficult it has been to keep your chin up in light of this information. But she ends on, but that's why I still fight. That's why I do everything I possibly can. So Alizé, in the grand tradition of Final Fantasy XIV, is still extremely well adjusted. She doesn't have her brother's political maneuvering, so she chose to spend her time learning to fight. And it'll be a great piece of the overall team we're reassembling. We'll have our our battle officer, tactician. That's a good way to put it. With the twins, we have, we have the, the one that tries to avoid war and the one that is ready for it should the need arise. We have to run! All we're trying to do is bring fruit home to kill a kid. That's no all we're deal. trying to do, Kyle. The last meal. And there have been many, many last meals. We have a nice, pointlessly candlelit dinner. That might be dinner. It could be breakfast. Either way. I love how annoyed you were <laughs> by the fact that this was candlelit. You're like, why is there a candle? Everything's light. It felt out of place, but now that I think about it, anything you can do to relax and camp bummer town, like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Fair. Although if it's been a hundred years, now I'm kind of with you. Like, well, they would have no need for candles. No. <laughs> Why well, would think... anyone have an affinity for candles? Well, there's dungeons. You know, we saw the moo and the riding home going down in the dungeons. So. Okay, good point. You probably have, uh, everyone's probably got blackout curtains, shutters on all the windows. I bet that's how literal fat cats were going to meet. That's probably how they got so rich. They own uh, all the drape companies in Norvrant. Dude, can you imagine having a more useless job than being the weather people here? Like, they're literally out in the city. You can go talk to them. They give you the <laughs> forecast. There's also biomes. Like, we know there's a forest, right? And we know there's a desert. Is there an equivalent of Ishgard? Is there a snow zone in Norvrant? Oh, I can't wait to see what snow looks like in a world completely overtaken by light. Because light doesn't necessarily mean hot. Otherwise, everything would be a desert. 
Can you tell that I really like the world building? Yeah, it's a good world. We've all done the shadow corrupting evil thing. I'm a monster now. Just simple little switches can really fresh things up. And that's what they did here. Is they took, well, what if light was the corruption force? And it's great. It's really interesting. And we get into that here with Tesseline. Uh, through her, we learn that the Warrior of Darkness, singular, she mentions Warrior of Darkness as a singular. It sounds like he's a fabled hero on the first. And also, the way she speaks of the Warrior of Darkness is as if he is still alive. Because she, she says something to the effect of, like, uh, he's never shown his face around here, sadly, or something like that. Like, he's this traveling hero that goes around trying to help people out. But I thought that was odd. I thought that was strange. And that's and, and so that that's where I look think back. I'm like, if they all died 100 years ago, wh- why why is Tesseline still talking about this figure as if they're still around? Because we know Ardbert has lingered, right? But Ardbert's lingering as like a, a soul still clinging to the first, not as a corporeal person. They can just run around and interact with people like normal. He even says as much when we when we talk to the. <laughs> he even says as much when we talk to the ghost of, of Ardbert. He ta- says that when it first happened, it didn't matter if I tried to talk to someone or yell at someone, they couldn't hear me. It still doesn't like Tesslin's not a hundred years old. Like <laughs> no, but you know, Grandma told her, and you know, Mom told her. You know, it's 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 short enough that it's become legend, but it hasn't completely faded from memory. Warrior of darkness, servant of death. Take care of our souls at our dying breath. Let sinners and eaters of sin go with thee, that all may return to the sunless sea. Honestly, this is all you right now, because I wasn't really paying attention to Tessaline, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. First of all, I was, a little, I was a little caught up on the candles, and then the camera started spinning around her. I'm like, headband? Wait a minute. I've seen some weird thumbnails before. Is this the gal who screams all weird? Oh. <laughs> Only because the headband. We're going to get meta now about the culture of Final Fantasy XIV content. Sure. Back when we first started doing it, we've been doing this for almost a year now. YouTube started suggesting Final Fantasy XIV videos for the first time ever. And I remember seeing one where like the face looked horribly f***ed up. And... Just assuming somebody was like just being clever with Photoshop and trying to make shit look horrible and fatal framey and just try and get those creepy pasta points from the Internet. Little did I know. So like this, I guess is barely a thing in my memory at this point. Little did I know that nobody was was adjusting a damn thing, that this is exactly as this horrific scene played out and looked in game. I thought Tesslin was going to be kind of just another like rando villager that's like just a cipher of our guide to kind of explain this region. And really it was just about getting to Alize. And I might go one further and say, I bet that's what the writers were trying to accomplish. They were over here misdirecting with Alize. Here's the carrot on the end of the stick. You want to go meet back up with your friend that you're not going to be paying attention to a p- possibly one of the most f-ed up things I've ever seen in Emma with, with what happens with Tesla. Cause I thought she was, you know, sweet enough a well-defined character enough. We get just enough information. We spend just enough time with Tesslene to make what happens feel horrible. It is beautiful, emotional torture. (laughs) And Haldrick is a huge part of that. Like he's a red herring of emotion and it's very, very strong. Who's Haldrick? Uh, Omen child. Oh, the creepy kid. Yeah. Creepy kid. I, yeah, this is the one thing to do. People think I'm crazy. The kid did not work for me. That kid looks evil. I get that the kid is supposed to kind of be like, like He's emotionally yeah. cut off like Gabu, yeah. but freeze the kid's face in a cuter expression so that I want to go save the kid because, oh, when I saw that kid just staring down the sin eater, I'm like, this kid's evil. This is like, this is, this is, this is Damien. This is Omen Child. This looks like something straight out of The Exorcist. I don't think you can. Like, you can't, like, put a little smile on his face. That's perhaps more creepy. The connection is, of course, for Alice, right? Just, like, just, 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 just furrow the brows. Good, just sad puppy eyes. That's all you needed to do. Alize comes over. She's already connected with Gabu, who was lost to Primals. She finds Haldrick, who is lost to the light. Like, there's a very clear connection for Alize to care and be emotionally invested there and why she would camp out here of all places. She's basically fighting. I know it's a, more of a void scent, light scent kind of connection, but she's basically fighting Primals and enthrallment 
in our own world. Haldrick's like the red herring for the players to be like, oh, don't, you know, don't do that. Don't, you know, whatever you do, just don't, don't do this. And so you have no expectation that they're going to mess with Tesline in this way. And it happens so quickly. All of these events, like it's, it's breakneck pace. Before we know it, we are running across the desert. We see the Sin Eater, which looks a whole lot like a boss that we already fought. Flies in, we see Howard in the distance. Tesling comes out of nowhere, has this awesome moment of cutting the wing off the Sin Eater. And right at the, for me, the moment I'm thinking, oh, this Tesling character, there's more to this Tesling character. What an absolute badass she gets run through. And we bear witness to just how horrific the transformation to a Sin Eater is. It's great storytelling. This is a wonderful setting of the stakes. It's gross. <laughs> It's yeah. just gross. And a lot of T for teen jokes. And like, I think this is all, this is all perfectly fine. Uh, apparently their original plan was for the scene to be a little more visually messed up. And I, I, I would love to see it. Um, I really would love to see what the scene was originally supposed to be, but I think everything in here is to perfectly within the realm of the rating that this game has, but it is visually disturbing enough. But to me, I think it's a lot more emotionally disturbing. It's very much along the lines of Resident Evil. You could even go a little cthulhu in here. Lovecraftian. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it, 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 and it, it really works for me, like, because I'm still trying to wrap my head around the fact that it's like, the light is bad, and now it's like, now we really understand it. Like, because I think you could, I wasn't really having this feeling. I kind of was already bought into the, the plight of Norvrant, but... Like, I could see you going through and being like, well, what's so bad? You stopped the flood. You seem to have a functioning society. Look how beautiful the crystal tower or the crystarium is. But but here we get it. It's like, no, like, if this happens to you, this is a fate worse than death. This is horrible. My point is, it's wielding classic overplayed tropes in such a fresh way. It is mixing and mashing and 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 remixing it in such a good way. It's like, I've seen zombies before. I've seen the the battle of light and dark before. Never like this. And it establishes how strong the Sin Eaters are too. Like a wing gets cut off, zero care. She goes through this whole horrifying transformation, slightly obscured by cocoonage, but even then in the in the meat and the bones and all the mayonnaise and, and chicken wings that are being stirred around by the Foley artists, like it's gross. In my head, it's just, it's the, the, the dog scene from the thing. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's what's going on. That's what they didn't show us. To that end, I now realize that all those thumbnails, those were tame photos. Like some of them did the waxy, waxy like build up, which was awesome. I, that is, that's iconic. But most of them stopped there. I haven't seen one that went to the full range of the transformation here. And again, it shows like how dangerous these predators are that. The only thing it can possibly do, like the last bit of her control, is to fly off because she knows she would kill everything if she could. Yeah, it has a final like, gut-wrenching moment of self-awareness where we still hear from Tesleen, but we're looking at that monster. Also, this worked on another level for me because I'm going to be honest. When we saw that, that first Sin Eater, I'm like, that's kind of a lame monster. The Tesleen <laughs> version is horrific. Yeah. Like that, yeah. that, that, the human face with the long human faces with long necks, man, going all the way back to Evil Dead 2. That stuff. Oh, yeah. Me up. Also, I love it. I love horror. I am a huge horror fan. <laughs> as messed up as it sounds to say, this disgusting display, this horrific, emotionally destructive display is what sold me on this expansion. I'm all in. I love everything about this horrific display that I just witnessed. Dude, I was actually nervous. Like, while we were heading towards this moment, because this is the big moment to land. Like, if you can't sell this, the main thing you're fighting, what are we doing here? Like, what's going to be the enjoyment of the game? Anytime a monster has a don't let it touch me factor, I'm in. And I don't want this thing anywhere near me. It is gross, it is weird, and it's so good. Now, can I ruin it for just a second with stupid technical questions? Okay. All right. You're supposed to, like, be injured by one, but survive, and that's what makes you turn. Tesslene wasn't going to survive that stab through the chest. <laughs> no. So, I'm a little fuzzy as to the rules. <laughs> I think she took a concentrated dose. Like, this was clearly one of the more powerful ones. Even Alizé is like, whoa, that's a big one. It even flies off, 
So like it loses a wing and then it's like, I'm fine. So this is a pretty high tier monster. So she took a direct hit from an upper echelon Sin Eater. So I think the top, the lower tiers probably scratch you. Uh, you know, they probably eat your flesh. They're after all your kind of crystal stuff and would just straight up destroy, you know, like zombies do. When all the zombies claw around you, they claw, they claw. And that's why people, you know, get ripped apart because there's all the zombies. They're going nuts. But one powerful zombie gives you that one big injection. You're a super creature now, which the Crystarium has like big laser turrets. I didn't get an Ishgard. I didn't get my I, thematic, you know, like thematically, yes, the, the the dragons invaded and stuff, but we didn't really participate. Like we could go full zombie apocalypse here, and it could be badass. I think that might be a bit where we're heading. Yeah. At least some of these zones, I bet, are going to have this story. Oh yeah. What if there's an outbreak in that city where everyone seems like they're totally rich and live in the high life? Mm-hmm. Ooh, that would yeah, be horrific. Mess that place up. Light scent chasing you through the the black shroud equivalent oh. through the woods. Oh yeah! Can we just do a cabin in the woods with light scent? Ooh yeah! Yeah, can we do it, Kyle? Can we go there? I hope. I I want to be uh, utterly distraught every moment I'm playing this expansion because so far I'm there. <laughs> it's the joy of aliens as well. Like they made all those toy lines with like, what if a face hugger grabbed a rhinoceros? I'm interested. I want to see it. I, I want to see all the weird sin eaters we can make in this world. It is off to one of the strongest starts of any MMO expansion I've ever played. <laughs> no wonder people lose their shit over this expansion. Yeah. If this is the beginning, I, I, I am legitimately looking forward to seeing where it's going. Let's feast. Just make that kid a little cuter so I don't want to throw him in a fire. <laughs> <It's just bad. laughs> I think we can still save the kid. You know, when we find the cure, as you often do in zombie apocalypses. Time to see what happens with Alphano. If you like our content, you want to support us, we've got a Patreon, which you can get to by going to supportourbromance.com. If you'd rather support us through merch, we now have a shop, so go check out buyourbromance.com. Thanks so much for watching, everybody, and thanks for being so patient as we get to Shadowbringers. Onwards and upwards to Alphano's political vacation. GG.